Hey, my name is Jay Warner Wallace, and I'm the author of Cold Case Christianity. I, I gotta tell you, if you're listening to this radio, you know you're in a good place, and I cannot endorse more highly the intellect and the passion of your host. So just enjoy this radio program. Is he a real one radio is the real thing. And Veda, thank you so much for doing the most important work of the kingdom. Hey, this is Greg Kokel, author of Tactics, a Game Plan for Discussing Your Christian Convictions and the Story of Reality, How the World Began, How It Ends, and Everything Important That Happens in Between. And you're listening to Is He a Real One? Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Veda Hedgeman, and we are here for the latest episode of Is He a Real One Radio? And we have a very special guest here. We have Mr. Paul Copan. He is a very prestigious, he's very humble, you know, um, but he's a very prestigious and wise man. And we will be discussing a very, uh, I'll say challenging, I think it's fair to say challenging topic on today. We're discussing the topic of slavery in the Bible. Does the Bible condone slavery? Does the Bible say that slavery is moral? And we'll get into the conversation about what all of that means. But first, uh, Paul, would you like to introduce yourself, say some of the things that you've done? Your awesome book, God is a Moral Monster, that's at least one of his uh, awesome books where he touches on some of this stuff. We can talk more about that after we finish our um, our dialogue. But Paul, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm a professor at Palm Beach Atlantic University in West Palm Beach, Florida, and uh, happily married and have uh, six children and uh, all in their 20s, and um, I have uh, have a PhD in philosophy from Marquette University and have uh, written or edited, co-edited uh, like 35 or so books and written journal articles and book essays and so forth for other, uh, in other books, and um, I'm often speaking, and uh, again, the topic that I'm often asked to speak on is <laughs> Moral monster. Uh, the spoiler alert: uh, No, uh, the answer. And uh, so I've also co-authored another book with my friend Matt Flanagan uh, called "Did God Really Command Genocide?" Another spoiler alert: No. And uh, but uh, we'll be going into the topic of slavery or servitude, a better word, uh, to uh, to that faithfully represents what's going on in the in the biblical text. But uh, we'll. Uh, we'll follow your lead on that, Veda. Thanks so much for having me on your program and uh, look forward to our conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, you mentioned that uh, you're often asked to discuss this topic, either this topic or the genocide thing, quote unquote, right? You know, uh, did God command to kill all the babies and stuff? Is he evil? And your awesome book is a big testament to that. You know, it is a challenging thing to tackle and uncover. And I think to a certain extent, many of us uh, students of the word and apologists, we do answer it and tackle it to a certain extent. But, you know, you are, I mean, you're known for many things, but one of the things that you are comfortably recognized as, and I think you embrace that, you know, as a go-to for this, for this topic. So, you know, as we get started, you know, I kind of just want to, um, I kind of just want to talk about, you know, the term slavery, right? You know, so when we're talking about slavery in the Bible, ultimately. Now, when it comes to that, when it comes to that, obviously, I'm American and I'm a black American. So obviously, you know, that's something that is near and dear to me and my ancestors and things like that. But not just people of African descent. But mostly everyone, when we hear the term slavery, we think of the ugly racist history that has happened in America as it pertains to slavery. So before we get to the scriptures that that some say seems to condone slavery, let's actually talk about what slavery or, as you said, servitude is a better word, actually means. Like, is the slavery that's in the Bible the same that we think about when we when we hear the word slavery? Yeah. Well, it's good, an important question to ask because that is the, the antebellum Southern slavery is what immediately comes to mind when people read about it in scripture. And it's, of course, there's also the institution within Israel uh, as opposed to the Roman slavery, which is, again, 
different animal. This is something that um, you know has uh, very de- sometimes very degrading elements, sometimes elevated uh, slaves and so forth who can get their freedom, etc. In the Roman Empire, but uh, but in the in the Old Testament, uh, there's a, a, a different ethos to it. Um, and what I would say is, in the Old Testament, we have what you know, especially for when it comes to the Israelite, uh, we have what is called indentured servitude. Uh, the term slavery is not uh, anything remotely resembling what we see going on in the antebellum South. Uh, we see, you know, the term servitude, Abraham, uh, sorry, or, you know, uh, or Moses or Joshua, I should say, these are called the servant of the Lord. Uh, the word that's used for slaves sometimes, uh, you know, it's just a benign term. It could be, it's a neutral term depending upon the context. So give an example. In the book of Exodus, you have God telling Moses to tell, to let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. They had been slaves in Egypt serving Pharaoh, and now God is telling Moses to tell Pharaoh, uh, they're serving you, but they're going to serve me. Same word that's being used. So one is good, one is bad, and uh, they're being brought from a negative situation of enslavement to positive servitude. But again, the same word is used. So so, uh, the term itself has to do with a dynamic dependency relationship. Uh, and it doesn't have any sort of negativity built into it. Uh, that's what the context furnishes. So we don't want to simply read in something negative in our day, uh, where we have these associations with an- the antebellum South. Uh, we want, you know, what we have is basically something like indentured servitude. Somebody is uh, needs to pay a debt, he's impoverished, and really what, you know, one's economic situation leads that person into servitude. It's not as though he, uh, you know, he's been forced into this, but his, you know, by, by somebody else through economic deprivation, famine or whatever, he, uh, you know, contracts himself out. Sometimes the term is used, sells himself or parcel to, uh, to others within the clan and your relatives and so forth who live within their tribal territory to with them. And to and they'll get food, they'll get clothing, they'll get shelter, they'll have work, and the maximum that you can keep is for six years. The seventh year, that person goes free. So, uh, so again, uh, it's not as though there is an inferior position here. Uh, a person is just a once he's out of debt, he's free, um, but he needs to pay off that debt that he owes. So that's that's what we're looking at, really indentured servitude. We can come. I know we're going to be coming to Leviticus twenty-five, and we'll talk. But, uh, but I think so far as Israel is concerned, Israelite is concerned, uh, we have a very clear indication of indentured servitude, nothing like what we have going on in the antebellum South. But I'd like to say, if the law of Moses were followed in the South, we wouldn't have had anything like mm. the, the, the negative, horrific slavery uh, that we're so familiar with. Wow. You know, so I have a, I have a couple of follow-ups, uh, but when you were saying a couple of things, it sounded a little choppy and I, I was trying to do a little bit of things on my end. I'm not thinking it's me cause I tried my headphones and just my loudspeaker yep. and I was still able to hear a lot of what you said, but just FYI, like it was a little choppy. So I'm not sure. Okay. Um, if it's something we can do about that, because you're saying some really good stuff. Uh, I don't want it to get missed. Um, All right. I appreciate it. Yeah. If I need to clarify something, just feel free to come back to that. Okay. Uh, try to cover over or cover what was in that choppiness. So, so I do want to go back to something that you said. And obviously, I know you know that we're going to go over a couple scriptures specifically that I want that I want to ask about certain verses but you know we may kind of just uh cover that in going back and forth so when when you mention that you know it's a servitude and there are laws in place and these excuse me these servants or or as some translations say these slaves you know they're able to you know serve for 6 years or like where do we like where do we hear that because you know I hear theologians say that I hear apologists say that but where where do we get that information? Like, does the Bible say that? Is that just something that we know from history? Or, like, where, where do we get that understanding from? 
Well, we have in uh, Exodus 21 uh, mention of these things and Deuteronomy 15, where the uh, a person who is in servitude years, uh, then uh, the seventh year used to go free. And we see in, uh, in passages, well, in, in Jeremiah, in Amos, and so forth, where Israelites are chastised by the prophets because they are keeping those who were in servitude longer than what the law of Moses mandated. So mm. they keep them uh, in servitude to pay off their debts for six years, and then the seventh year they go free. And here they were taking advantage of people in their vulnerable situations, and these prophets were calling them out, saying, you're violating the law of Moses. So, so you have not only the legislation, which isn't always followed, um, and, uh, you know, and then you have the prophets reinforcing these things, saying you are mistreating, you are taking advantage of those who are vulnerable and, uh, and calling them back to obey these uh, regulations in the law of Moses that are, again, not that the, this is an ideal situation, servant ideal, but it is something that is instituted to regulate, to control. Uh, you know, Jesus talked about law in place, the law of Moses, because of the hardness of human hearts, not because these are necessary the very best laws ever, uh, but given the situation on the ground, these are implemented uh, or these are legislated for controlling, uh, to regulate, to keep things from getting out of hand. Hmm. So from a skeptic's ear, they're hear what you're saying and say, why not just cancel it all just through and through? What would your response to that be? You say cancel all the debt, just let them go and not have any sort of servitude at all? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that would be your response, right? As you put it in that perspective, because yeah, the... we, we, we can start there. Um, okay, well, you can maybe bring it to a modern day situation. And again, we use that language, that transactional language right. uh, in contracts. So uh, a basketball player who is, you know, he's owned by a team. There's a team owner. Uh, he's sold, he's bought uh, by a team. And we don't think, oh, this is demeaning to that person. That's just the, the contractual language that we use. And, uh, and so if he signs a contract and then says, hey, I want to be free from this contract. Uh, no, you've signed on for a certain amount of time. You've got to finish your term. You can't leave. And, and Exodus 21 talks about that as well. You can't leave. If you come in and then you marry someone who comes in at a, you know, who's in at a different time to, to serve in the sa- under the same roof, you get married. Well, if you've come in at a different time. You can't be freed from your obligations when you get married. You've got to serve your term. It's sort of like somebody who's been in the army. Uh, he says, oh, he tells this uh, recruiting officer, I, hey, I just got married. So uh, I just wanted to say I'm not going to be in the army any longer. Say, sorry, you got to finish your contract. You've got to term and then you can you can go ahead but uh, you you've made agreement we're counting on you and so you're you need to deliver on that that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here so it's a good faith contract you agree to work for a certain amount of time after all you're in debt it's not as though you just um, put yourself under somebody's roof and uh, and and uh, you know you just let them take care of you, you know usually you're driven there because of economic circumstances now the person who is in this household is pretty, you know, the, the servant, it becomes part of the household, eats with the family and so forth. It's not as though that person has a, you know, is, you know, has to sit, you know, you know outside or something and is relegated to, uh, you know, the treatment uh, of, you know, someone who's less than human. No, the person actually is, as John Golden Gay, Old Testament scholar says, that person who's a servant becomes part of the family, just fits in with dynamics are of, of what's going on. So like so a guest who's staying with you and just kind of stays with you and kind of just fits in whatever's being. So, so it's that sort of, uh, it's not this, um, you know, inferior, uh, you know, that you're treating someone who's, you know, you're deemed an inferior or something like that. That person has a debt that needs to be paid and staying with you during the duration of that time. Yeah. And just to kind of add on to what you're saying, uh, Paul, you know, so, you know, basically what we're saying here is in, the, in even using the sports analogy, you know, 
what we're saying is there there are human beings who have a contractual obligation and they and they willfully entered into a contract that says okay i'm going to play for the lakers for two years for five years or for whatever Mm -hmm. and even if they want to get traded you know they if if the owners and the people of management decide to trade that player that's ultimately onto them right now in 2019 that was a big thing with uh, if we're using basketball with Anthony Davis or Paul George. Though the management of the team and the owners of that team, they ultimately did not have to trade those players, even if it was pressure and stuff to do so. They didn't have to because they had the contractual right to keep them until those players' contractual obligations were fully met. So when we compare that to the slavery uh, that – happened in american's history that wasn't voluntary (laughs) you know that wasn't voluntary you know when people were kidnapped and beaten and raped and things like that it was no say so it's you know it it wasn't a matter of you know what i have a debt or i have something that i want to do for my family so i am willfully deciding to go into the situation that i know has rules and laws and stuff like that Uh, did i say anything wrong Wow. No, you got that. And, and then in, in some cases, like at the end of, uh, you know, you're in um, uh, Exodus 31, that if you, if a person who is a servant says, I love my employer, my master, um, and, you know, says, I want to be under his roof forever, then you can have an arrangement to just permanently stay uh, because there is that loving, warm relationship. After all, that person becomes part of the family. Now, there are situations where someone can be, you may want to run away from that situation because it's a, a because you're being mistreated. And that would be permissible. Uh, in fact, foreigners were permitted into Israel. If they had run away from a master, they could settle within any of the cities within Israel that this was permitted, that they were not allowed to be sent back to the master. They were to care for a slave who had been mistreated. Now, in Babylon, some Hittite uh, treaties and so forth, extradition arrangements, extradition treaties, where if a slave runs away from our country to yours, you send him back to us. Well, in Israel, they didn't have any sort of that. They said if they run away from a harsh master, with us. So it was to be a place of refuge. It was to be a place where those who had been treated harshly could find reprieve, help, find uh, rest and and freedom from that kind of oppression. And all the more so if you're an Israelite and you've got someone who is mistreating you and to be able to get up and leave uh, because you've been mistreated uh, would be permissible. In fact, you know, if a if you even do such a thing as knocking out a, an eye or a tooth, uh, again in in Exodus twenty one, if you're struck and you and that happens to you, injured, you get to go free without any debt remaining. Why? Because you've been injured permanently. So it's not as though the 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 master could do whatever he wanted to. He didn't have the freedom to do that, which is again quite different in the from the antebellum South, like you said rape, maiming, and so forth, uh, you know, get a terrible uh, situation where people were permanently injured, people, you know, the master had full sway over what went on in this person's life. Again, it's a far cry from what we see going on in ancient Israel. Now, I want to go through a couple of scriptures specifically in Exodus 21 uh, yeah. but before we move on, but I'm not going to start at the very beginning. I'd actually like to hear you respond to verses 20 and 21, where it says, if a man strikes his male or female slave with the rod and he dies at his hand, he shall be punished. If, however, he survives a day or two, no vengeance shall be taken for he is property. That sounds like a slave owner can beat the slave and as long as he don't kill him or uh, kill him within 48 hours uh, of being beaten, then the slave owner is get is getting out scot-free. What would you say to the skeptic who, who poses that question that way? Well, uh, keep in mind that this is in the context of accidental injury. What do you do when there's an accidental injury? So this is the second accidental injury that's listed here in, uh, in Exodus 21. 
Uh, and in the previous one, there is a mention of medical bills being taken care of, that the person who's been injured, uh, then there needs to be treatment. Those who, the person who, who's injured him needs to take care of those medical bills so that he, you know, and again, that would look, you know, in a hearing, if a person says, hey, I'm taking care of the, the medical bills for that person, well, the judge will view that with greater sympathy than if this was done maliciously, done to harm that person. So when we get to this situation where a person who has been struck, maybe out of, you know, obviously out of uh, anger or something, note first of all that if this person, you know, who is employing this servant strikes him so that he dies, then that master, that employer, can be put to death. So it's not as though, oh, that's just property. No, you don't put somebody to death for ruining property. Uh, this is a life for a life situation. Uh, and so this is a much more uh, you know, elevated view of the servant in Israel than you do have in other ancient Eastern settings. And so the, the situation then comes, well, what happens if this person is, you know, walks around for a couple of days and then maybe dies after that? Well, a, a couple of things to keep in mind. One is that it's, 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 it's the, the judge can make a, a ruling here based on assessing the situation. This is just a sample case. And so if the judge sees that there's something fishy going on, he can make that sort of a judgment and rule against this person uh, um, who has struck the servant. But it, 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 the implication here is that it wasn't intentionally done. It wasn't as though he uh, harmed him uh, intentionally, but rather this is an accidental injury. And, and again, the question comes, well, how do you then uh, you know, handle, you know, how do you view, you know, this sort of thing for it says he is his silver. Some translations say he is his property. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, again, it's literally he could be translated he, or that is his silver. The question is, is it referring to the servant who is his silver? That is, you're hurting your pocketbook if you're injuring your servant. Why? That's, that's a stupid thing to do. Mm -hmm. Or it could be in the context of medical bills that that silver that is being paid is for the medical fees that are used to treat that person who has been injured. So, uh, so again, that's a very plausible alternative too. But again, it's very clear that this is just mere property because again, if, he, if this person dies, is struck and dies, then the person who struck him can be capitally punished. Again, that's not language of property here. So, so those are a couple of things that I would say in regard to that, uh, in regard to that text. Yeah. And another thing that I'll, that I'll add to that, Paul, is that essentially, you know, I, I, I love what you mentioned in the, the beginning of that soliloquy, you know, when you mentioned injury or accidental injury, because what it is essentially doing is, is, uh, managing uh, reckless behavior, right? You know, so you aren't able to just um, re respond and get aggressive and stuff with a servant that you have and just do whatever you want with them, you know? Right. So, so a response of what we're, uh, of what it sounds like the rules that are being in place is saying, hey, look, there are there are, um, you know, uh, repercussions for this, you know, so it, it's really kind of setting in stone, you know, uh, things to abide by in, in that sense. How would you respond to that, to, to, to what I just said? Yeah, no, I think that's a, a, a fair uh, representation of, of what, the, what the text is saying. And I think it illustrates the, the biblical vision where, one, all human beings are made in the image of God, servant, employer slash master uh, alike, and that the dignity of the servant is upheld uh, in, very clearly in that text where the, uh, if he is, like I said, struck dead immediately when he's been hit, then it means capital punishment for the person who, uh, who, who harmed him. So, so again, this is a, a very different vision than what you see in the ancient Near East where you have you know, um, some people who have greater value because of their class status, whereas in Israel, things are much more democratized. You have people who are referred to as, you know, if you see your brother, you know, in need or whatever, you know, the, the language 
brother and sister. It's a more democratized sort of thing. Even the king is under the same kind of legislation as the common person. So, so again, there, there is that fundamental democratizing of, uh, of, of law in Israel that applies you know, to one to the other. In fact, even the, the alien who lives in the land, the same laws apply to the alien as well as to the, uh, to the Israelite, so that there is a, a, a very strong commonality in legislation, for whether you're, whether you're a you know, native Israelite or whether you're uh, you know, someone who is an alien living in the land, like somebody like Ruth uh, from Moab. So I want to go back. I know, we, I know we covered a little bit of uh, Exodus 21 and talking about 20 and 21, but if, if you'll indulge me with a couple specific verses in Exodus, for instance, in, in verse 4. In verse four, you know, when, when it says, if his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall belong to her master and he shall go out alone. Now, the reason why I'm asking you about these certain verses that may sound troubling if you just read it one verse at a time and people take it out of context. The reason why I'm asking you this is because some people may hear the indig- the indigenous servitude, they're working off the dead, it's rules in place about them, you know, um, not being assaulted and stuff like that, but they'll still go, okay, well, I need an answer for this, though, because certain things might sound like, um, you know, it, it still sounds cruel. You know, some, some people may make that argument. So that's why I kind of wanted to tackle a, a few verses specifically. So verse four, when it says, if his master gives him a wife, and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall belong to her master, and he shall go out alone. So that sounds like the servant won't be able to keep his family in that. So what would be your response or explanation or, uh, to that? Yeah. There are you know, a couple of things that could be said here. Uh, one is that if there is Again, this may negatively apply to the woman. And I think later on we do have, in Deuteronomy 15, this is clarified, where uh, a, the woman is also explicitly mentioned. But it's, it's not as though a judge can't make a ruling that, and apply it to a woman, even though a man is being referred to here as the kind of the party here, the person who goes out first, etc. So it could be reversed. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, this could be applied very, very readily. But I think that the issue here, let's just say it's, it's with a, that the man goes out first. Um, well, as I said before, there is a certain contract that is in. And there, again, the children who were there came about through the, you know, again, the, the woman who had been. Uh, again, introduced to the, uh, to the man. They got married while under the roof of this uh, employer. And so there is a contract that needs to be fulfilled. It can't, you can't just say, well, we're married, and therefore we, uh, you know, we need to go out together. Uh, it's sort of like joining the army. You join the army and you get married, you still got to finish your term of service. And so the woman who finished her term of service cannot go out. But keep in mind that there is a fundamental obligation here to release the servant after six years. That is a fundamental obligation. It is applied by the prophets that you can't hang on to your servants longer than six years. You need to let them go in the seventh year, et cetera. So so what are the options then? The options for the servant uh, the, you know, uh, who has been, you know, whose debt has been relieved. He's, he's paid his term of service. Well, he could kind of wait around and, uh, you know, and again, but he's kind of in no man's land. That person is going to be separated from his family. He's got to kind of sustain. Uh, or, you know, I mean, you do have rights of redemption where you can buy you know, kind of pay what is owed to fulfill the contract, and then that person gets to go free. We see that at the end of Leviticus 25, where a kinsman redeemer, a close relative, is able to buy a person out of servitude so that he is, there's no longer any obligation. That free. Well, uh, having, given the fact that this person who has just left, his wife behind, 
he doesn't have resources necessarily to come back to, to rely on in order to out. So what often happens in the more, you know, you know, the default position as it were, is that you stay behind with your family rather than leaving. And so the person says, you know, I love my employer. And so that person then is able to uh, you know, stay within that household. There's a ceremony that makes that, that you know, he's taken to the, you know, kind of the legal proceeding. He's taken to the uh, doorpost uh, before the, before the elders, before God, and has his ear pierced with it all. And then that's a mark that that person is permanently, uh, you know, going to be serving this person, permanently going to be part of the household. And, and again, it's a, a picture of love, expression of love here. And it's a, it's a win-win situation. That person works, that person has security, is close to his family. Uh, that person is, you know, part of the family. Uh, and so there are, there are fringe benefits that come with that. So that's the more likely scenario when you are uh, in those financial straits. So that's, those are kind of the alternatives that, uh, that are there. So it's helpful to understand a little bit of the cultural background, the ancient Near Eastern background. It's not like, not anything like what we know today. Uh, right. And so we have to be careful about thinking, oh, it should be just like our day today. And here are some quick solutions to that problem. Uh, it's it's a much more embedded social structure. You've got uh, you've got a lot a lot of other stuff that's going on that we just don't have in our day in our much more individualistic society and so forth. Yeah, and something I would like to add to that, and and, and please feel free to uh, co- you know uh, correct or add or anything uh, when I say this. But I, oh, anytime we're reading scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, I like to point out that. The Bible was written for us, but it was not written directly to us. So it is the inspired word of God. God did superintend all 66 books that we have in the Holy Bible, and his word is still alive and well today. However, because God chose to deliver his word through uh, human men, there is a cultural thing in all 66 books, you know, and I just think it makes us more in formed readers and learners of God's word when we when we exegete and ha- and try to develop an understanding of what the purpose is of what's going on and what God is actually saying and why and who he was actually writing to mm-hmm. so yeah. in, so uh, what were you about to were you going to no, add no, I, I think it's it's very helpful to keep in mind certain situations a certain context uh, that we read, I think, with a little bit more of a sympathetic uh, view to what's going on, understanding that there is a certain context that we may not be taking into consideration, and also remembering the words of Jesus in Matthew 19, 8, uh, when it came to, say, divorce laws, and I think it can be applied in other, in other settings uh, or to other legislation, that Moses permitted certain things because of the hardness of human. Uh, God, Moses, presume that people will sin. And so uh, they'll presume that things are not the new heavens and the new earth, that things are not, uh, uh, you know, in the Garden of Eden, uh, that there are certain things that are negatives that are in place. And so uh, the question now becomes, how do you manage the situation on the ground with sinful human beings who develop flawed social uh, moral structures and, uh, and, and so God gets his hands dirty, as it were, and works with the situation on the ground uh, and tries to move his people into a redemp- in a redemptive direction. Paul, would you, would you say that it's possible that a piece of it is that God didn't want the Israelites to do things that were similar to what they possibly endured when they were slaves in Egypt? You certainly see that repeated over again. And uh, it's interesting that a lot of critics ignore the repeated admonition. It's like 35 times yeah. where God is reminding the Israelites that they were once right. slaves in the land of Egypt, uh, that they were foreigners, that they were aliens there. Right. Uh, and so the, what, is the, uh, what is the reason for referring to that historical 
situation over and over again be repeated <laughs> yeah. uh, with the Israelites that they wouldn't mistreat those who could most easily be taken advantage of in their own society. So you'll see this triad often mentioned of uh, the orphan, the widow, the alien, and sometimes you'll have the Levite who doesn't own land, uh, that these can be taken advantage of most easily. And so therefore, uh, you know, if we come across a verse that says, oh, look, this is really, this is strange, and, uh, and, and this is questionable, what, what is interesting is they will, people will take that odd verse that maybe requires a little bit more of a background uh, understanding, uh, to interpret, they will let that be the that determines everything about Old Testament servitude, rather than saying, oh, look at this major emphasis on mm -hmm. remembering that you were once slaves in the land of Egypt, and therefore not taking advantage of people who can, you know, who are the most vulnerable among you. They completely ignore right. <laughs> that undertone that is so pronounced and latch on to verses that would under, you know, seemingly undermine that. And I think what we ought to do is give the benefit of the doubt to those repeated texts that give the, the heartbeat of what God is seeking to inculcate into the minds of his, and hearts of his people, rather than the other way around where, oh, here's a stray verse here or there, therefore let's run with those and ignore the kind of treatment that we ought to be showing because you know, we were once slaves in the land of Egypt. So that uh, gives a little bit of perspective, I believe. You know, and another thing for me, you know, when, when I was a, when, when the Holy Spirit was working on my heart and bringing me to Christ from atheism, one of the things that the Holy Spirit used for me when I was still having questions, which of course I still have questions, but you know, uh, I have a trust in the Lord now, but one of the things that the Holy Spirit used, Paul, was, you know, the fact that if this was man-made and made up, you know, if the Bible was just made up and Christianity was made up, and at the time, I don't even know nothing about Judaic history and everything, but I'm like, if this is man-made, we would leave that up we would leave that out. Like if me and you was like, Hey man, let's try to manipulate some people so that we can, you know, control something. It's a lot of things in scripture that we would leave out because it's really, really hard to explain, you know, but I think, but I think that when we are responsible learners and responsible readers, a, we learn the context, you know, B, we can um, understand the reason of it. And we can also see how it, how, things ultimately, you know, lead to the redemption story of Jesus and stuff like that. You know, I have a, I have one last uh, request and it saddens me because I think I know how to fix the audio issue, but it means that we won't be able to see your beautiful face. All right. <laughs> so that saddens me, but, I, but I think it might be best if we uh, just don't do the FaceTime thing at all, but just okay. do exclusively on, on, on the phone. Okay, which is, that which, fine. So cut the video and then just keep the sound. Um, no, I'm saying, no, I'm saying you can completely log off with like your webcam and just call in on okay. your phone. Ah, okay. And Paul? Yep. This is, I hear you so clearly. I hear you so clearly. Beautiful. All right. Now it's sad. Now I I promise when I upload it, I'll make sure it's a nice, wonderful picture of you. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, before I, I don't want to hold you too much longer, but before we get to some of the stuff that Paul mentioned in the New Testament, you know, I did want to point out a couple of things and then ask you something about Deuteronomy. Uh, for one, in Deuteronomy 15, Verse 15, for anyone who's, you know, watching this and taking notes, that's one of the many times where God reminds them um, that they were once slaves in the land of Egypt, you know, in Deuteronomy 15 and 15. Now, even do you have anything that you would like to say about Deuteronomy 23, 15 and 16, where, where it says that you shall not hand over his master, uh, uh, you shall not hand over to his master a slave who has escaped from his master, who I'm sorry, who has escaped from his master to you, he shall live with you in your midst in the place which he shall choose in one of your towns where it pleases him. You shall not mistreat him. Now, you kind of touched on this a little bit 
already, you know, where, where we, where we see that, you know, a, they're commanded to be treated humanely. And even, you know, even when there's, you know, um, certain scenarios, you know, like they're from, you know, another, um, vicinity or something like that. Do you have anything you'd like to add about that? Those yeah. verses I just read? Right. Yeah. I, I think it's, um, you know, here's one of the laws that mandates you don't send back a runaway slave to his harsh master. And of course, that was uh, legislation that carried over into the modern era uh, during the, you know, the fugitive slave law, where, uh, where if a, a slave ran away from his master in the, in the United States, um, you know, in, you know, in the antebellum South, say uh, he had to be returned. And so there were posting postings to, you know, saying return this slave, such and such a reward, et cetera. Uh, well, uh, again, this is uh, a far cry from what we see going on in the scriptures where we, we don't have, well, for one thing, we, kidnapping is prohibited. That's uh, punishable by death. Uh, and you don't have the uh, mandate to return slaves. In fact, you have a prohibition against returning slaves who've been harshly treated, returning them to their masters. So, uh, so again, it's, uh, it's a different picture altogether. And like I said, if the laws of Moses were being uh, attended to, then we wouldn't have had those kinds of slave issues and the negativity associated with uh, with servitude in the uh, in the antebellum south it would have been a you know, much different picture altogether right right i have one last uh, old testament thing i'd like to ask you about before we move on to the to the sure. new testament and this is in leviticus uh, leviticus sure. 25 and this mm -hmm. is verse uh, 46 it says you may bequeath mm -hmm. them to your sons after after you to inherit as a possession forever. You may right. make slaves of them, but over your brothers, the people of Israel, you shall not rule one over another ruthlessly. Now, I'll just let you, before I even um, add anything, what, what's your response to, to that scripture? Yeah, um, you know, again, there is that uh, mention of, you know, or you shall not treat him, that person severely, um, and, and let me just uh, give, it's interesting that the text goes on from there. Uh, so in verse 47, uh, we read that if a person who is a stranger becomes a person of means, then he might be in a position to have an Israelite serving him, yes. uh, which is uh, very, very interesting. So the same term that's used throughout the chapter, stranger and alien, or sometimes uh, translated a resident alien, uh, you know, that you have that uh, carrying over into verse 47, that you have a resident alien who becomes a person of means so that he can acquire an Israelite. It's interesting, that same word is being used, acquire, kana, is, you know, that's been used before. You may acquire these servants from other nations. Well, the, the, uh, the foreigner... <laughs> That can acquire an Israelite. Does that mean that the Israelite is therefore just property? Hmm. The Israelite is just a uh, you know a, you know a, you know a piece of furniture. Uh, no, we've already seen that that's not the case. In fact, um, this language of uh, of purchasing, uh, this language of acquiring, is also used to the Israelites uh, in Exodus 15, where God has brought them, He has bought them, delivered them rescued them out of Egypt, uh, and they become his people. So it's, it's seen as kind of a, a, an official, historic, legal transaction, as it were, that now through this act, they become the, the, you know, the nation of God. They become the people of God, the covenant people of God, etc. So, so you have that kind of a language that is, that is going on here. And it's certainly not justifying mistreatment, uh, in uh, in verse 2543, it says, The Israelite, you shall not rule over him with severity. Yeah. Um, and foreigners were not allowed to be treated with severity either. You were not allowed to, you know, they were, if you ran away from them, they were to be able to, if they ran away from another country to come to Israel, they were to be able to settle in any of these cities. Now, you might have certain situations where, for example, if there's warfare and there are, uh, you know, 
those who are uh, war prisoners, well, what do you do with them? Well, a common thing that was done was that you just slaughtered them. Um, but if these people are you know, just war captives, uh, well, what do you do? Uh, well, they may be put to productive use by serving in people's households. Keep in mind, too, that they cannot acquire land. And this is a uh, in the context of the year of Jubilee where the land reverts back to mm-hmm. the is- Israelites who are living in these tribal lands. And so if they've been in debt, well, every 50th year, the land was supposed to be free and clear, delivered back to them uh, without any sort of debt uh, associated with it. Well, that just doesn't apply to the foreigner. What is a foreigner to do? Uh, well, the foreigner typically has to attach himself to a uh, household. And this is, you know, there's really no land that he can claim for his own to settle down in. And so the easiest, the most natural way of fitting into the, uh, the Israelite society, if you want to get away from where you've been or you've been, uh, you know, your, your land has been overrun or something like that and you're a war captive or whatever, then this is a, a natural way of going about it. You attach yourself to a household and, and uh, since the, your, your children aren't going to be able to acquire uh, any property either, it makes sense that you would continue on living in this household. Like I said, you become part of the family. There is a mandate that you could not mistreat the alien uh, in the land. So, so there is that same language. I mean, the Israelites are called God's possession. They are, these people are, it says, you know, that you may bequeath them to your sons after you to inherit as a possession forever. Well, that's the same language used of the Hebrew in Exodus 21, that he becomes a uh, part of the household forever. Uh, that same yep. sort of language is being used. So, so again, we've seen that there is a very, you know, again, is it ideal? No, no. Uh, it, it's not. But is it does it does it um, affirm the humanity of these um, you know, servants? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, are they seen as uh, you know when you look at the biblical understanding of these servants, they are made in the image of God. Uh, that if you mistreat them, then you can be held to account and so forth. So so there's a, there are a number of parameters that are in place here. And again, we shouldn't use just a, a verse or to here to overturn the general undertone of the Pentateuch or the law of Moses, where we read, read repeatedly, you are not to mistreat those who are foreigners because you were once foreigners or aliens in the land of Egypt. It's not all of a sudden overturning that, uh, that legislation that calls the Israelites to look with sympathy upon those who are foreigners in their land. And, and again, if there are criminal elements or if there's a, there's a, you know, a danger or people need to be kept uh, um, at bay or there's a certain suspicion of them, well, that's a, that's a different issue. Um, and you, you respond accordingly. But, but oftentimes people were war captives and this is a, a way of assimilating them into uh, the land of Israel. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And and again, y'all, you know, for anyone listening, there is a context to everything. You know, I remember we used the basketball analogy earlier and I'll I'll use another one. Uh, I believe I heard Shaquille O'Neal one time as he was hosting, uh, uh, I think it was inside the NBA. He was talking about basketball and it was him and two or three other former players and a host. And they were talking about uh you know, many of the greatest basketball players of all time, you know, from Wilt Chamberlain to, uh, to Dr. J to Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There was a certain context one time where where Shaq said, I'm taking Kobe over all of them any day of the week. He was talking, but when he said that he was talking about a certain, he was talking about, a certain um, context of the players whom he who he has played with and against over certain eras, and and Kobe's ability to change and because he had a familiarity with Kobe, he was like, I would take Kobe. He wasn't saying when he said that that he necessarily thinks Kobe is the best player of all time. And I actually don't even know who Shaq believes is the greatest basketball player of all time. But I know that if you just want to take that one sentence that he said, you know, you could 
use that as a means to say that that's what Shaq was arguing, and it wasn't. He was talking about the players who he played with and against and the tenacity that he has, and because he has so much um, personal experience with it, he was like, I trust like I trust Kobe with that typical with that particular assignment, you know, so sure. it, 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 it is lazy of us to read one verse to read one sentence and have a trillion objections. Now we can have a good question. I always say, hey, we can have something that's a really good question, but it, that doesn't mean it's a good objection, you know, so. You know, so I just want to point that out again. And Paul, I know um, some of the answers that you're giving to the questions that I'm asking it, it may feel redundant, but it's because it's a different verse and, you know, it's a different objection. And one last thing that I'll say before I move on, and Paul, please feel free to chime in if you desire. We got to remember that the chapters and verses to scripture were added at a later time to help us keep up with what we're reading and learning. Now, if I write you a long letter or not even a letter, let's just say it's an essay, a two page essay, you know, that that my daughter did for eighth grade. It's just a two page thing. It's just a two page essay. It would be a disservice to that essay to just take out one sentence without caring about the entire thing that that essay is for. You know, you have you have no idea what that essay is about unless you've taken taken the time to actually read it, to actually understand what was her research, et cetera, et cetera. And it's the same thing with biblical text, particularly when we're talking about. A, there are there are there are scriptures that can sound very troubling if you just read it. If you just read one or two sentences and go, wow, this this is troubling. But if you take the time to listen to this interview with Paul Copan and I, or if you or if you take the time to to read the Bible uh, more fully and in its completion, you will see, you know, you will see a lot of this stuff and also understanding that the Bible is written for us, but not to us. I know that was a bit long winded, but do you have anything that you would like to add to that point. Yeah, no, I think you're you're right in reminding us to uh, to not to do a disservice to an ancient context uh, that um, is far removed from us. And, uh, and I think in many ways, giving the benefit of the doubt to, you know, like, like we were just saying, the, the major emphases, uh, rather than focusing on something that is, that is minor and letting that minor text that may seem a little, you know, questionable or we may not understand it fully, uh, that that then dictates how we understand the entire tone of what is going on in the Old Testament legislation. So, so yeah. So I think there's uh, what's you know kind of a, a charitable understanding of, uh, of of looking at these texts rather than um, being ruthless uh, with them and not understanding them uh, according to their according to their context. And, and, you know, what I would actually add to that is I would actually argue that God was very serious about servants being treated humanely. If a lot of the questions uh, that we've spent uh, in this particular conversation came from Exodus 21, the chapter before that, Exodus 20, you know, everyone at least heard of the Ten Commandments. So God is obviously rolling out information and stuff that is very important to him and his will. So right after he goes into the Ten Commandments, he talks about how to um, treat your servants humanely. So I would actually argue that this is a, you know, a point of emphasis is saying that God wants humans to be treated humanely. And although obviously he was speaking in the historical context at that time. Right. Yep. And that's uh, interesting that it point it g doesn't move into uh, property law. It moves into how do you treat uh, your servants. Uh, so there is a uh, you know, again, it's very it's a it's a unique feature here that this is uh, brought front and center uh, right after the uh, Ten Commandments are delivered. 
Okay. Well, Paul, I got a few more scriptures. I want to move over to the New Testament just a little bit, and then I will let you go. I'm thoroughly enjoying this conversation. I believe the listeners uh, will be edified, and I believe God is magnified. Uh, I want to ask you uh, about a couple of Paul letters, Pauline letters, you know, particularly Ephesians chapter 6, where if it, where it says that slaves be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Now, what what is Paul saying and why when he says that there? Well, a few things to keep in mind. Uh, of course, there is the institution of slavery in uh, Rome. And um, as Craig Keener, a New Testament scholar, points out, uh, Paul is writing to those who are uh, in you know, urban settings where conditions are uh, much better for those who are slaves than, they, you know, than those maybe out in the countryside, those who are in mines or uh, you know, in, uh, in more degraded circumstances. So it's a, it's a, uh, these are situations where uh, you know, in, in these urban centers where uh, conditions are much better. Uh, again, uh, that's not to justify Roman slavery, but it's just to note uh, the, uh, the conditions in which the, uh, the, um, the, the audience finds itself. Um, Paul is reminding the Israelites, uh, oh, sorry, Paul is reminding the, the people of God who are slaves in these households to, uh, you know, to, you know, not to throw off the shackles, uh, not to throw off all constraints. So there are still obligations that they have within households. And Paul, of course, in First Corinthians 7, says if you can get your freedom, obtain it. Uh, he's encouraging them to, uh, to do that. Uh, he's also reminding them that, uh, yes, you may be a slave, you may be stuck in this situation, but one, it doesn't mean that you're not fundamentally equal to your master or uh, anyone else in the body of Christ, that there is no slave nor free, uh, Paul says in Galatians 3.28. This is a key text, and Paul is actually, in what he is doing in his letters, he is actually creating a mindset. He is uh, shape, helping shape a worldview which recognizes that there is a fundamental equality, that, there, that those who are Christians who have servants, slaves, uh, as well as those who are slaves themselves as Christians, they are part of the body of Christ and that they are fundamentally equal. And Paul also reminds them, it's, it's interesting, if you read 1 Corinthians, sorry, if you read Romans 16, we are. We see that there is a uh, that there are two slaves who are mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. Andronicus and Urbanus. These are yep. two common slave names in Romans 16, and you have people who are uh, you know elevated. You have mention of Ananias uh, or uh, and Sapphira. Uh, sorry, um, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, I should say, and you have. You know, these you know, people who have a higher status, the church meets in their home and so forth. These are people who are servants of the Lord. They're working in Christian ministry. But so are these slaves, uh, Urbanus and Andronicus, who are Paul's fellow servants. They are yoke fellows. These are people who are partners in ministry. Paul is not seeing them as degraded. Paul is reminding them that, yes, you may be, you may be you know, enslaved to someone. You may have this relationship where you can't come and go as you please, but you can do the work of ministry, that there is a partnership that Paul, as a free Roman citizen, has with these people who are in, you know, who are uh, technically slaves, but they are serving the body of Christ. And what's more, you have further undermining of the institution of slavery by Paul saying, greet one another with a holy kiss in Romans 16, 16. So you've got the slaves there, you've got the free people there, you've got those who are um, well off, those who are less well off, and Paul says to treat each other as family, greet one another with a holy kiss. And in addition, you shared a family meal, the Lord's Supper. This is a picture of equality. It wasn't as though the slaves had one table and the masters had another. 
this was something that was for all the body of Christ. There's neither slave nor free. So all of these things are really conspiring to really undermine and undercut the institution of slavery, uh, that this is something that is creating a different mindset altogether. It's a new social structure that the Christian faith is introducing regarding those other structures as irrelevant, uh, that mm-hmm. fundamentally they don't uh, get to the bottom of who you are as a, you know, in terms of your, yes, you may be a Roman citizen or you may be, you know, a slave in a household, but you know what, you have greater status than you realize both you know, whether you're a master or a slave, because you are family in Christ, and there's a fundamental equality in understanding that. So these are the sorts of things that we need to come away with, uh, that that is the sort of mindset that Paul is seeking to inculcate in his readers, um, that there is a new way of looking at things. In fact, their very master became a servant in order to set people free. And Jesus himself said that he came to set prisoners free. He came to remove oppression. Luke chapter four. Well, that you know, if you if if there is dehumanization, if there is degradation, Jesus is against it. He came to set people free from those sorts of things. So those are also perspectives to keep in mind as we uh, look at some of these New Testament texts and uh, and uh, kind of navigate through them. And of course, we read later on in the Book of Revelation that uh, those who are kidnapping uh, people who are engaged in uh, in treating humans as cargo. That is condemned. Uh, that is, um, the, the Babylon is engaging in commerce this way, using people. Uh, and of course, the book of Revelation condemns that just as it condemns kidnapping in First Timothy chapter, six, uh, chapter 1. Uh, so a lot of the things that we associate with slavery, um, treating humans as bodies uh, treat, or, or cargo, um, as well as um, uh, kidnapping for sale, those things are condemned it, themselves within the New Testament. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'll even I'll even add on because the question that I just that I asked you came from Ephesians six. If I would have kept reading, you know, I would have got to verse nine where it says and masters, you know, uh, do the same things to them. So after he says after he gave uh, that, you know, those instructions to people who are currently serving, he says, hey, and masters. Do the same things to them. Same thing for all these people, all you folks in Ephesus, all the everyone who this applies to. So I I address this to the servants, to the slaves, and now I'm addressing this to you, masters. Do the same things that I just said to them. I mean, yeah, the same thing that I said to them. That's what I want you to do to them. And then he says, give up threatening, knowing that Mm -hmm. both their master and yours is in heaven, you know, and, and, you know, and there is no partiality with him, you know, so. Indeed, that's a, a great point to make. Um, I, I'd also like to go. You touched a little bit on on First Timothy, you know. So, can, can you can you tell us what exactly uh, this means? And again, you know, um, you may have touched on this already a little bit, but First Timothy verse um, verse one and two says, "All who are under the yoke of slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor." so that the name of God and our doctrine would not be spoken against. Yeah. Is- um, sure. Uh, you know, here Paul is reminding those who are in these positions. For one thing, you know, some people say, why didn't they protest slavery and so forth? Well, yeah, I mean, you, if you want to get killed, sure, you can you'd protest that. Um, you know, that's, mm-hmm. I, that's uh, an option, but not, not a very wise one. And uh, you know, so in these sorts of settings where the 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 the, the servant uh, is you know becomes a believer and he has uh, you know someone who is uh, for whom he's working uh, you know as a slave um, that you know if he says hey I'm I'm free in Christ I should be able to let I should be able to uh, be freed from you well of course what is the perception here going to be. Um, you know, the the Roman society is going to understand this to be an act of rebellion that the Christian I mean is hard enough for Christians and then to yes. uh, seek to uh, create uh, to stir up further trouble by saying we can rebel against this social uh, structure um, which with without any chance of success 
uh, becomes really uh, you know a problem. It puts a lot of Christians in jeopardy themselves. I mean, think of a you know there's a woman I, I, again. I don't know if this is an anecdote given by David Instone Brewer in a in a in a conversation he had on unbelievable radio. But he was talking about how in Saudi Arabia where uh, you know, where if a woman becomes a believer and women don't have the kinds of rights that we are familiar with here in the West for women, uh, if she says, "Hey, I'm a I'm a Christian now. I should I should be able to, you know, do what men do. I should be able to have the kinds of positions that men do, and so forth." Well, y- y- yes, technically that should come about in a society that has been influenced by the Christian faith, but in a patriarchal society where there is a strong bias against women having these sorts of these roles, these equal roles in society, it becomes a much more difficult prospect. So for you to just kind of insert yourself and say, hey, we ought to be treated with equality, we ought to do this, well, you, what ends up happening is you start to jeopardize other women who are believers. They start to become uh, you know, a, they see, are seen as a threat to society. The Christian faith is seen as subversive in the sense of overthrowing all restraints. And, uh, and, and there's no wise strategy for bringing about change. It's just, let's just overthrow things. Well, that's not a, a, a wise way of bringing about change in this sort of society. It may actually be more harmful if you, you know, to your cause, to, say, women, in Saudi Arabia to to engage in these sorts of protests. Uh, so so again, there's wisdom is called for here as well, um, and it's 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 sometimes you kind of bite your tongue, you you hold, you, know, you teach what the truth is about you know your your position in Christ and equality in Christ and so forth, but uh, but it may be more difficult for those in society to to hear that and and to embrace it. Um, so it may be the sort of thing where you, through sharing your faith, through influencing the minds and hearts of others, that they eventually come to realize those sorts of things, and uh, and slowly but surely society begins to change and people adopt a new mindset. So so again, those are some considerations that we also ought to bring to the uh, to the uh, to the broader picture. Yeah, and you know, and I would kind of I would you you mentioned a point that I wanted to make sure we said, you know, before we closed anyway, you know, about, okay, well, why didn't they, you know, protest slavery? It's not, let's keep in mind, again, let's be aware of the context and who was, and who got used um, to write the scripture and, and who they were writing to. Paul, yes, obviously was revered and respected and everything, but he also was a man who got arrested a bunch of times and he got beat mm-hmm. up and assaulted a bunch of times himself. So like you said, Paul, you know, there is some wisdom that's going in to the instructions and stuff that he's, you know, that, that he's giving his brethren, right? You know, like, mm-hmm. yes, is God giving these words because it's God's, uh, uh, guiding Paul as he was writing these letters, but God was using a mortal who was very, very capable of being killed and beaten and and stuff himself. So he's so God is given so God was giving Paul words that were that were helpful within that uh, society and that context. So again, this requires us to you know, to study more, you know, it's more than just reading one line. It's more than just reading one or two sentences. It's, you know, but, but it's also being responsible readers. Absolutely. Yeah. No, a good, a good point, a good exhortation to, uh, to, to end with on this. Uh, so yeah, well, well put. And uh, uh, yeah, so, so a, a good word there. I, I receive that. Uh, if, if I can get, I, I have one more for you, and and this will be sure, the last yeah. one. Okay, mm-hmm. so can can you help us understand uh, the point that Jesus was making um, in you know in his gospel? So obviously, for those who are listening, you know uh, we don't want to take anyone's you know knowledge for granted. In the in the letters that we read that come from the New Testament, this is obviously uh, many years after the Old Testament letters were written. 
by in in the book of Ephesians and First Timothy. This is after Jesus uh, lived and died and ascended into heaven, and Paul was doing his ministry. That's where those letters came from. Okay, to help that, if you're listening and you're trying to piece together some context, the question that I'm about to ask Paul is coming from Jesus's words himself uh, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter. 18 verse 25 and this will be the last one that i ask you paul uh and and jesus says but since he and i can read more of it if you like i'm not sure if you're familiar with what i'm reading but it says yeah, I, but, I got it here. okay but since he did not have the means to repay his lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made some will see this or just read one or two sentences uh in in this and say well even jesus himself is saying that a slave needs to be sold you know so you're response or teaching to that question would be what? Mm, yeah. Well, I think Jesus is often referring to how things are often done, uh, that there is this, uh, it's more descriptive than uh, prescriptive uh, in that, uh, you know, there would, you know, that harsh treatment would come to people who acted in this way. Um, and and it's also helpful to keep in mind too that Jesus is, has in the back of his mind the um, judgment that would come through the Romans who would come into Jerusalem and uh, and bring an end to uh, Israel as a nation uh, with you know in AD seventy uh, that this would be this would mean the demise of the nation of Israel. And so Jesus is speaking along those lines. These are the sorts of ruthless things that will be done when the Romans come through. And, um, and, and of course, he is, you know, sometimes there is, uh, uh, you know, he's using you know, modern war, you know, you know the, the warfare of his day, the, uh, the institutions of his day to refer to how things are done, how people um, would normally be treated if they were, uh, acting in this way, but it's not as though he's saying that this is therefore the best situation. Uh, for example, he talks about in, in, in Luke chapter 16, talks about a shrewd uh, steward of a household who makes all these deals without his master knowing it, uh, makes all these deals because he is going to be losing his job, and so he's trying to make all these uh, bargains with people you know, so that he can maybe have some, uh, have their sympathy after he's out of a job. And, you know, Jesus isn't saying, you know, and that's okay, you can do that. No, he was not, the point was that uh, he was commended for thinking ahead, for being shrewd uh, in how he was using his money. And so Jesus says that, uh, yeah, that believers, the sons of light, need to be better <laughs> In terms of how they use the you know the you know the mammon of unrighteousness, or they use worldly uh, wealth, um, you know they need to be laying up for themselves treasures in heaven, using it for those purposes. They might be greeted by those who have been influenced uh, by your investment. Uh, you know when you come into your heavenly dwellings. So there's that picture uh, that Jesus is uh, drawing. That's not necessarily commending everything about that unjust steward, mm. uh, or the you know, but but it's simply saying you know, highlighting one point, <laughs> saying he did this well, and, and the master uh, commended him, saying, "Wow, you really thought ahead. You uh, you got me on that, but uh, you know, I have to give my hat is off to you for uh, the way that you uh, thought ahead and prepared the way." Uh, you know, for your own future, even though I got ripped off. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. so anyway, so you see that kind of a picture. So you don't want to read too much into these sorts of scenarios and, and, and draw, all, you know, a lot of theological conclusions. I'm not saying that there are no conclusions to draw, but I think um, Jesus is simply speaking more descriptively and, and highlighting certain things that, um, you know, would typically take place in his day, uh, to show the severity of judgment or something like that, but uh, yeah. not as though he's saying this is the way things really ought to be done. Wow. So that goes back to this little word we said a few times is context, context, mm -hmm. 
know, and context, you know. So, there Paul, you go. Paul uh, I, I truly can't thank you enough for your time. You know, I kept you a little longer uh, than I wanted. It's usually about an hour. I think that the recording time where we actually spoke is um, is just a little bit more than that. But, you know, because of the technical difficulties and stuff, you know, um, it made it a little longer. I thank you so much for for mm. bearing uh, for for bearing with us and and blessing the listeners you know with your knowledge and um and teaching things that you've learned uh bef- before we uh you know um go off i mean is it uh, you you have several books that i think uh, are certainly worth reading i already mentioned earlier the is god a moral monster but i think that was a, a 2011 book you know you've you've also had did god uh I should have had really commit genocide. Yeah, yeah, the guy really commit genocide, you know, you know, which is awesome. You know, it could be a whole nother hour, which of course I ain't gonna even try to do that. <laughs> but like, you, you know, but but that, but even that element of it, you have a lot of really really good works. Is there anything that you're currently working on or that's recently released that you'd like to people to know about? Yeah. Well, I mean, sure. I appreciate your asking. I mean, I've done. Uh, some work in the area of biblical ethics. So, in yes. uh, yeah, I did uh, a book called, uh, you know, co-authored a book called Introduction to Biblical Ethics: Walking in the Way of Wisdom. Um, I have um, done a uh, book recently called What Would Jesus Really Eat? And uh, that has to do with um, a lot of. I think in our day, we're seeing people who are saying eating meat is immoral. It's unchristian. Uh, you know, like PETA, uh, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, did this campaign in 1999 saying Jesus was a vegetarian. And uh, a lot of people are who are, you know, professing Christians are saying, yeah, it's not compassionate to uh, to eat meat, to, you know, and of course, Jesus himself ate meat and uh, provided fish from the multitudes and so forth. And uh, and, and I think there's just a, a misguided compassion that drives many people, and they don't see that there is a actually a, a very strong permission uh, that is given uh, for, for eating meat as a, as a gift from God and so forth. So, uh, so several of us have, you know, Walter Kaiser, Old Testament scholar, and uh, Timothy Shaw, who's a philosopher, and a number, you know, several of us have worked on a book to address some of those modern-day challenges where uh, what's called prescriptive Christian vegetarianism, where uh, where it's moral or morally obligated to uh, to eat a plant-based diet rather than eating meat, um, and uh, and we point out the, the misuse of scriptures, a, a bad theology that, uh, that drives uh, a lot of the conversation forward. And and we I have a chapter called Veggie Tales, uh, which deals with some of these <laughs> uh, um, misrepresentations, and uh, so that's out and. Uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, again, you just look at my website, paulcopan.com, and uh, see some of the stuff that I've been working on there. Um, and uh, so, Arguments for God's Existence, a uh, book on naturalism, and, uh, and so forth. So, there's a lot of stuff that's available at a popular level as well as a scholarly level. So, would we'll just uh, point people to my website if they want to get more details. Hey, on on now, I do admit that I wasn't uh, I haven't read those <clears throat> those, those books yet, you know, on, you know, like, like what would Jesus eat and, and stuff like that. So I'm certainly interested in that. Just curious. Do you cover do you cover any of those Levitical dietary laws and stuff in there when you're when you're discussing? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I do touch on some of those things in in a, in a general way, but uh, I go into more detail on that in my book. He's got a moral monster. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Paul, again, very grateful for your time. Very grateful for your wisdom. You know, uh, thank you for blessing is here real one radio. And more importantly, thank you for being a blessing to the body of Christ. You know, uh, the, all the time that we spend studying and, and reading and listening to other people's lectures and sermons and taking notes. The reason why we do that is yes, to edify ourselves so that God, you know, uh, can, can edify us and communicate to us, but we should also share it with our sisters and brothers. So I just want to thank you for your books, your art articles, your interviews, your presentations, and I want to encourage you in that. And again, I'm very grateful. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I appreciate you. And um, I'm very grateful to have you. And for those who are listening on Is He a Real One Radio, we always ask the question, is he a real one? Yes, he is. And the he we talking about is Jesus, y'all. Jesus is a real one. He is God. And we are so grateful that he is. He rose from the dead to prove it. And he died for me and you. We would be silly. We would be foolish to reject him. Let's accept him in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Paul, thank you so much, my brother. Um, All right, mate. Great to be with you, brother. 